How's everybody? Y'all good? Well, the greatest takeaway I thought from camp was that 23 people totaled the Sunday morning, two Sunday morning services and three services at uh, night services at youth camp. 23 people gave their life to Christ. And that's what, that was really, really, really awesome and a big, that, that's the most important takeaway for me. Hey, uh, we welcome our online audience. We're glad you're here. Uh, if you're online with us today, feel free to talk to us. If you're in the building and online, you've, you've checked in online to our online service, talk back to me. Uh, my son Lance says the more you talk back to him while he preaches, the shorter he preaches. I figured out over the years that's a lie. <laughs> so I'm not even going to say that to you. But I would love for you to talk back to me uh, the things that are meaningful to you, the things that are talking to you, uh, and it might help somebody else. You know, uh, every Friday, whether you know this or not, uh, Pastor Connie and I are on the radio with committed couples on uh, 98.7 Walk by Faith Radio. Um, and we do Facebook Live at the same time we're on the radio, and the Facebook Live uh, lets you see behind the scenes what goes on at a radio show. Some people tell us it's kind of funny because, um, I don't know, how many of you know, how many of you know getting inside Pastor Connie's head would be a weird space? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes she, sometimes the things she says, I'm just like, where did that come from? But... Um, Anyway, I love her. Like she said, we're about to be married 43 years, and it's, it's great. It's a, it's a good deal. Uh, today marks the beginning of our um, new series, The Last Arrow, and subtitled, Are You Surviving or Thriving? You know, survivors just get by. Thrivers are going for the best. Thrivers are going over the top. Thrivers are trying to be above average. And, you know, um, I, that, that's what we're trying to figure out in this series. I believe that God wants me to challenge you to shoot for the top. Now, whether you get there or not is not the issue. It's that you go for it. It's that you go for above average. You go for excellence. And um, if you'll stand with me as we read God's Word... We're going to read somewhat of an obscure text, um, maybe even insignificant to some, but I promise you I will bring the New Testament into this because I've tried to teach you as a church that you've got to read the Old Testament through the eyes of the New Testament for it to really make any sense. And so we will do that today as well. But in 2 Kings chapter 13, Beginning in verse 14. When Elisha was in his last illness, King Jehoash of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel, he cried. Israel told him, Elisha told him, get a bow and some arrows. And the king did as he was told. Elisha told him, put your hand on the bow. And Elisha laid his hands on the king's hands. Then he commanded, open the eastern window, and he opened it, and then he said, shoot. Now notice in the New Living Translation how that's punctuated. Elisha emphatically said, shoot. So he shot an arrow. Elisha proclaimed, this is the Lord's arrow, an arrow of victory over Aram, for you will completely conquer the Armenians at Aphek. Then he said, now pick up the other arrows and strike them against the ground. So the king picked them up and struck the ground three times. But the man of God was angry with him. You should have struck the ground five or six times, he exclaimed. Then you would have beaten Aram until it was entirely destroyed. Now you will be victorious only three times. Then Elisha died and was buried. Father, I thank you for your word, that it's alive, it's quick, it's sharper, more powerful than any two-edged sword. 
Lord, that your word is able to divide us under to the thoughts and the intents of our heart, is what Hebrews 4.12 says. And Lord, I thank you that as I speak your word, let my words be your words. Let my thoughts be your thoughts. Lord, because I declare over my life today that you are the vine and I am the branch. Lord, and without you, I can do nothing. I am totally dependent on supernatural ability to communicate your word. And may the Spirit of the Lord touch these people, your hearers, Lord, that they would hear that you have called them to be above average to be thrivers and not just survivors and father we will give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise for what you do today and all God's people said Amen. you can be seated in this somewhat obscure text that could be overlooked maybe even seen from by some as insignificant I believe that this story is the story of God wanting more for you and I than we could even think or imagine. I want you to believe that. I don't believe that any of us sitting in this room that we were born to be average. I believe that many of us choose to live a life of average, a life of mediocrity. It's our own choice. Because when you read Psalms 139, when you read uh, Jeremiah 1.4, when you re read Ephesians 2.10, when you hear God say in the New Testament, you are Christ's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, before you were a twinkle in your daddy's eye, none of us were intended to be average. You cannot read God's Word and read how God knit us in our mother's womb, how He knew us before we were born, how He said, marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows really well. Odds are that most of us choose to live an average life, an ordinary life, because it's much easier than living above average. When a person chooses to live above average, the people that choose to live average lives are saying, hey, come back down here with us, you're not better than us. A wife, a husband, co-workers, it's your job. When you choose to be excellent, stop that. They don't say it out loud. Maybe some of them do. They say, stop that. You're making me look bad. When we choose to live an above average life, we become different than the world around us. Because most of the world is just that, average. And it is easier to live an average life. It is easier to live an ordinary life. The husband that's going for God, praying, reading his Bible, witnessing to people. I used to embarrass the hound out of my kids because I didn't just preach about witnessing. I would witness to the wait staff at the restaurant. I would, I would have a word for them. I would say, well, Connie's saying, I still do. Yes, I still do. My kids just don't go with me to the restaurant very much anymore. <laughs> Choose to be above average. Defy the odds. See, you have no control of whether or not you've been endowed with above average talent or above average intelligence, intelligence or above average physical attributes. I'll never forget, as a late elementary, fifth, sixth grade, on into early middle school, going to basketball camp after basketball camp after basketball camp, and the high school basketball coach over at Coronado was helping Joe Myers at his basketball camp every summer. Coach Hogue, he knew me, and he knew I was destined to probably play at least high school basketball he knew there was some ability there but he said Ed I've seen your parents you're not going to be tall <laughs> he said you're going to have to be faster than everybody else you're going to have to jump higher than everybody else you're going to have to shoot better than everybody else and I took that guy as serious as I knew how to I used to back my mother's car right down 52nd street here at 21 25 52nd street I would back my mother's car into the driveway turn that car on and shine the lights on the driveway so I could stay up while it was dark and shoot baskets I wanted to be above average I had to be I was this tall in the eighth grade and haven't grown an inch <laughs> true story I wasn't blessed who knew that when I got married and started having kids I would have two boys that are six three what the heck it's wrong God knew I was called to preach not play basketball because I, I tried to play basketball even in Bible school. And that's another story. That didn't work out well. 
because I was totally disobedient. Are you going to choose to defy the odds? This next slide is something I've never read in a book anywhere. It's a Pastor Edism. Average is not is your enemy, not your friend. Average, mediocrity. Refuse to meander in the maze of mediocrity of life. There's enough people meandering in the maze of mediocrity. mediocrity. See if I can speak English. Rise above it. Choose to be above average. You can't choose what you're born with. You can't choose your family. But you can choose your future. And the way you choose your future is you recognize that average is your enemy, not your friend. You may not be convinced of this. You may read this. You might take a picture of it. You might put it on your phone. I don't know what you would do with it. But you know what? You prove it out when you live beneath God's intended best for your life and your family and your business. When you choose to settle and live in a life of mediocrity, you prove this out. As we journey through this series, The Last Arrow, about thriving and not just surviving, I believe it's a clarion call that we're going to raise the bar. We're going to raise the standard of our faith. We're going to raise the level of sacrifice. You can't choose to live a life above average and not recognize that it requires sacrifice. It requires sacrifice of your time, sacrifice of your talent, sacrifice of your energy. It might require sacrifice of your money. But you know what? To be great, to go above average, to go above and beyond requires a life of sacrifice, which is why many people choose to stay average, because they don't want to sacrifice. It's about raising the bar in our expectations of ourselves and uh, raising the bar and having an incredible belief in the goodness and the generosity of the God we serve. That God wants to bless us. God wants us to be above average. That it's His call upon our lives. He said, well, that's great for you, preacher. You, you, you've got a call of God on your life. So do you. Your call is not, maybe not to preach. Your call is to make money, to be a king. And I'll be a priest. You be a king. You be a queen. You be the one that influences the marketplace. Your call is just as important as my call. Most people never shoot for excellence and above average for one simple reason. The fear of failure. They fear Not making it. Not being good enough. All those years hearing that about my basketball ability that I was short. I would have my mother drop me off at the men's gym at Texas Tech. And I would go play basketball against guys bigger than me, older than me, in an effort to get better than I was. It's the only way you'll ever get better is play with people. Do things with people that are better than you are. Be around people that are smarter than you are. Be around people that that know more than you know. If you do not get around people that know more than you know or better than you are at things, you, you want to learn how to pray? Get around people that pray. It's the only way you'll get better. I've got a little video clip. I apologize to our Facebook Live audience. Due to copyrights, you will not be able to listen to the video You'll have to go find it. Uh, We'll type in the link, the movie, and where you can get it from. It's on YouTube. You can find it very easy. But those of you here in the audience are going to get to enjoy what I consider. uh, It's a little humorous, but it will also, I think you'll get the point, and I will help you get it.
Too many people watching. You have fear of being above average because when you step out, everybody's watching. When you declare, I'm going to live for God. When you declare, I'm going to raise godly kids. When you declare, I'm going to stay married no matter what. Too many people watching! Are you going to shoot your arrow anyway? Or are you going to sit on it? Are you going to survive with an existence that is just average or below average? Or are you going to shoot your arrow and aim for above average? It's a choice. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said this. He said, Dad, is there any other way to do this? You remember this story? It's in Matthew 26. He took Peter, James, and John to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, and they fell asleep. And Jesus is sweating as if it were drops of blood upon his face. And he says, Dad, is there any other way we can do this? And then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. The only way you get to be above average is if you do it God's way. You can't get by with doing it your way. You can't buy, get by with doing it halfway. You can't get by with doing it the old way. you got to do it the way Jesus calls you to do it. And you find that out in his word. You find that out when you're led by the Holy Spirit and you walk in a life that's obedient to God. The last arrow, this series, is about not quitting more than anything else. Because, see, most people don't fail because they make mistakes. Most people fail because when they fail, they quit. The Bible says the righteous fall seven times, but the righteous gets up seven times. They don't quit. I stand here and I've not found a way to get around failure because I am not perfect. All I know is I can't tell you how not to fail in the endeavors of life, but I can teach you how not to quit because I am not a quitter. I refuse to quit. I refuse to stop. I'm going to keep striking the ground. I'm going to keep shooting my arrow until my quiver is empty. I will shoot the last arrow. Let's take a look at this obscure text, and let me just make some observations, and then I'm going to pull in some stuff out of the New Testament to help you make sense of it all. In 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse 14, when Elisha was in his last illness, indicating he had been sick before, or been sick for a long time, King Jehoash of Israel visited him and wept over him. My father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel. He cried. Here's the deal. Here's the big thing that we need to recognize about this about the 14th verse. Elijah and Elisha. Elijah was Elisha's mentor. And Elisha, Elijah was going about his business one day when Elisha was plowing the field with his oxen, with his family, and, and he was doing a family business. And he, when Elijah went and laid his mantle on top of Elisha, this is found in 1 Kings 19. You can write it down if you're taking notes on the back of your bulletin. I'm sorry about the outline. Our copier broke this week, so we didn't get that done. But here's the deal. He lays the mantle on him, and he calls him, and immediately Elisha quits his job, takes the yoke, cuts all the yokes of the oxen up, starts a fire, kills the oxen, feeds everybody there with it, and says, I'm going to follow you, Elijah. In other words, he doesn't leave himself an out. He says, I'm not going to be average. I'm not going to serve God halfway. I'm not going to follow God partway. I'm going to burn my old livelihood. I'm going to destroy the oxen. I'm going to destroy the yoke, yokes of it. And I'm going to serve God wholeheartedly. None of this halfway stuff. And then it gets 
on in Elijah's life, and he knows his end is near. And he tells Elisha, stay away from me. And he says, no, wherever you go, I'm going. He repeats this about three different times. And finally, he crosses the River Jordan, and he, and he, and he asks Elisha, what do you want? He says, I want a double portion of what you have. And he says, well, if you see me go into the heavens, you can have it. And he says, get out, get out of here. Don't follow me. Well, he won't stop following him. And he gets to the other side of the Jordan. In other words, he won't quit. He won't quit. He won't quit. And he gets to the other side, and he sees Elijah taken up into the heavens, and the mantle falls. I haven't actually researched this. I'll be honest with you. I've read it in literature, books. But somebody that's smarter than me has actually counted all the miracles that Elijah did and all the miracles that Elisha did, and it is exactly twice as many. Great miracles. Like an axe head floating in a river. Explain that. What's the deal? Well, Elisha is a prophet. Elisha is a man of God. Joash has come to him. He sees that he's about to leave. And notice in verse 15, Elisha, to, Elisha didn't even pay attention to the declaration. I see the chariot. You're about to die. I see the ch And Elisha totally ignores him. Doesn't even comment on it. Go get a bow and some arrows. Eli does, it, does it sound like to you that Elisha's on a mission? Elisha's got a word. There's something on the inside of him that he's got to deliver. Go get a bow. And the king did as he was told. And Elisha told him, put your hand on the bow. Put your hand on the bow. And Elisha laid his hands on the king. Now, the Old Testament really doesn't talk a lot about the ministry and the impartation of laying on of hands like the New Testament does. But that doesn't lessen what we see in the New Testament and we look at the Old Testament. Can you imagine the significance of a, a king and a prophet and, the, and Elisha, uh, Eli, I mean, Joash grabs the bow and on the other side of the bow, I can just picture Elisha going, <laughs> there's something meaningful going on. There's something important being transferred. There's more than meets the eye in this confrontation or this talk or this conversation whatever you want to call it verse 17 then he commanded open the eastern window and he opened it he said shoot he didn't say shoot he said shoot emphatically so he shot an arrow and Elisha proclaimed this is the Lord's arrow and on the arrow, on the arrow of victory an arrow of victory over Aram, you will completely conquer the Armenians. I take this to mean in a New Testament way that God, just what we talked about in the scriptures this morning, that Jesus died on a cross, he was buried, he was resurrected, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. It said Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he said, thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. I take that to mean I've got victory. I take it to mean in Romans 8.31 when he says, God is for us, not against us. Who can be against me? Because Jesus is on my side. I can shoot my arrow. I can fail and, and still go forward. Failure is an event, not a person. You're not a failure. You just fail. But when you truly, truly make the mistake of quitting instead of getting up, therein lies the problem. But we have been promised victory. Just like shoot the arrow. It's the arrow of the Lord's victory. Jesus shot his last arrow. He didn't leave anything. He didn't hold anything back. We're free in Jesus' name. We've got to believe it. We've got to see it. We've got to say it. We've got to think it. We've got to receive it and live out of our fourth dimension and believe that stuff. 
I shot my arrow over and over and over in public school after public school, in schools, in churches, in conferences, in camps, television shows, documentaries. As a lead pastor of Generations Church, I'm still shooting my arrow. I'm not quitting. We're doing a radio show. We're doing things that we're, we're doing outreaches. We're doing va- vacation Bible schools, back to school uh, uh, outreaches. We're doing things that uh, trunk or treat for our neighborhood. We're doing things at Generations Church to touch our city teach our nation, train the world. We're going to shoot our arrows till we don't have any to shoot. Even if we fail, even if we miss, we're going to shoot again. As long as I'm the pastor, we are. I hope you're with me. But I hope more than that, what makes Generations Church a dynamic group of believers in Christ followers is that in in the marketplace, in your business, in the insurance office, at Walmart, in your business where you're painting houses, Justin, you're shooting your arrows. You're touching people's lives for the kingdom of God. You're striking the ground. And that's where we get to, he says, so... He said in verse 18, pick up the other arrows and strike them against the ground. Notice this instruction in verse 18 as you look at the screen. This is an open-ended instruction with no specifics attached to it. So the king picked them up and struck the ground three times. How could King Joash know that hitting the ground five or six times was the magic number? Because there was no specific instructions. But the man of God was angry with him. Clearly, there is a dynamic going on in this story that we weren't there. We don't get to hear it. We don't get to see it. But the man of God was angry with him. You should have struck the ground five or six times, he exclaimed. Then you would have beaten Aram until it was entirely destroyed. Now you will be victorious only three times. Do you see this? The promise of complete victory was prophesied when he shot the arrow. But now it's been withdrawn. You're not going to win completely. Why? Because obviously the man of God knew that when he only hit the ground three times, he wouldn't commit it. Now don't ask me how he knew that. I'm telling you, there, I, it's one of the things we may have to ask when we get to heaven. But these, I'm, I'm just going to ask some questions maybe that you're thinking in your head. Was this king, was he just tired? <laughs> was he bored with the old prophet? Maybe he was fat, overweight, had been resting on his laurels. He's ready to move off the scene. And he says, I don't, I don't want to mess with this old man. He's a prophet. He's, he, you know, it's like listening to a 63-year-old man at youth camp. He doesn't know what he's talking about anymore. By the way, I'm 63 and just finished preaching at youth camp. <laughs> it's amazing that teenagers will keep listening to an old fart like me. <laughs> Why? Because I'm going to keep shooting my arrow. I'm going to keep listening to God. Did he view the prophet's instructions as meaningless and ridiculous? What am I doing here? He's just indulging the old prophet before he dies. I don't know. I would like to think that when the king gave me the instructions to strike the ground, that I would have hit it until I broke all the feathers. I would have... Banged it and banged it and banged it. But I don't know. I, I just don't know. Then Elisha died and was buried. But what all of this conversation leads me to think is this. How many times have we thought we failed when in reality what we did was just quit? We didn't fail. We just stopped trusting God. We just stopped being obedient to what God told us to do. We stopped believing the promises of His Word and did our own thing. I can't answer those questions for you. I can for me. 
and 26 years of speaking in public schools and preaching camps and churches and all those things. I, I can remember a time so specific that God brought a man into our lives uh, and, and he just spoke directly to me. He said, the Lord is telling me you need to write a book about your experiences and about helping these kids in these schools. Well, I've yet to write the book. Oh, it's on the inside of me. I've got, I've got two books inside my computer that I've started, but I, I didn't fail. I just quit. You know, like I always say, you know, confession's good for the soul, but it's terrible for the reputation. <laughs> Maybe you're like me. Maybe you've got an area of your life that it's not that you qu- failed, it's that you quit. Let the Holy Spirit talk to you. Maybe you're sitting here saying to me today, you quit and you stopped. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you got tired. Maybe it was just boring living for God. Maybe you just thought the Word of God and Pastor Ed's sermons are boring and irrelevant. I don't know. But I want you to see this next quote that I wrote on the screen. Most of the time we stop before we are finished, or more importantly, we stop before God is finished. We stop believing. We stop being, we stop being obedient Because, oh, God, you promised this, and it didn't happen. And you get mad because it didn't happen Burger King way, your way right away. If you're over 40, you know what that means. Under 40, you probably don't. I just realized, once again, I'm old. We're the microwave generation. We want it done right now. And the truth is that sometimes we stop before we're finished or we stop before he's finished opening the door. Can I just say this to you? I didn't say it in the first service, and maybe it's for some of you online, or maybe it's right now for some of you in this room with me. But God's more interested in your character than he is your comfort. If it takes longer than you thought it should take, It's because he's working on the inside of you, getting you ready for what he's going to do. And if he did it too quick, you wouldn't be ready. If he did it too quick, you couldn't handle the success. He's more interested in our character than in our comfort. Am I the one who just quits or I'm the one who keeps going until all my arrows are gone I can't I I know what my answer is (laughs) and there's even some people sitting here I hope I I don't know I'm going to point it out I hope it's not you and certainly don't want you to raise your hand and embarrass yourself but but there's a certain amount of people that they have their arrows and they have their bow they have their call they know what they're supposed to do but they just put it on the mantle and display it for everybody to see oh look at my arrows look at my bow oh look at this God called me and it's just up there for everybody to, to nothing's ever been done about it but it's just for everybody to see I hope that's not you I was thinking about this sitting in my office preparing this week and my phone, my cell phone sitting here and I'm seeing some people talking to me. That's good. Some people are watching and that's good. Some more of you can talk. But I got my phone and I took a panoramic picture in my office and it's on the screen here. And I just want to tell you what you're looking at here. And uh, it's a little distorted because I had to make it bigger. But on the far left is, is my family, my grandkids, uh, my children, my dad's in a picture right here. Uh, I don't know if uh, Michaela's down here, uh, my sister's daughter, but this is her grandfather, my dad, right here. And uh, here's a picture that um, um, my kids gave me for Father's Day one year. Um, this is my, Lance superimposed this picture of me preaching. How many of you have seen that before? Yeah, my crooked finger sticking out. Um, but he superimposed that picture. What's so important about that to me is it, this picture behind here, 
I'm in Mongolia preaching to, speaking about sexual purity to over 5,000 teenagers that came to that auditorium for three days in a row. And here's the crazy thing. This, this uh, PowerPoint picture that's right here, it's all written in Mongolian. It got translated. <laughs> So anyway, this up here, right here, this, this is a uh, piece that I was given when I was in Seychelles, West Africa. Seychelles, if you don't know where, most of you have never heard of Seychelles. It's 1,200 miles out in the Indian Ocean off of the coast of Kenya. And um, it's, it's, just, it's a group of 43 islands. Only three of them are inhabited. And I went there once, and then I got invited back by the government of Seychelles. I spoke in 21 schools in 13 days and did a five-night revival in, in their civic center. And, and this is called, here's what they call it, it's a reminder. They call it the love nut. I, I can't explain that. At least not in a public setting, I can't explain it. But... This picture right here, you can't see it very well because of the glare when I took it, but that picture right there is me and Dawson McAllister. He's one of my ministry heroes. Dawson McAllister, some of you may have heard of him, you may not. He just recently passed away. But he uh, wrote books for teenagers, wrote books for youth pastors. Connie and I were raised on his teaching material when we were in the youth group at Trinity Church. And when I became a youth pastor, and when I became a senior pastor, I wanted to send our kids to his conferences. He did 26 conferences around the United States. He did one in Denver and one in Houston, but not one in Dallas and not one in Lubbock. And so I called up their office one day as a, this is what I'm talking about, shooting your arrow. Who wants to be average? I called up their office and I said, we want Dawson to come to Lubbock, Texas. And the director, the agent or what manager, whatever you call the guy for Dawson said, can you get a thousand kids there? Real gruffly. And I said, yes. <laughs> Hung up the phone and said, oh, dear Jesus. <laughs> he said, well, if you can get a thousand kids, we'll come. Well, I, immediately, the, I, I went to Trinity Church, and, and Randall Ross was the pac pastor back then. And I said, will you let us use the sanctuary for free if I can get 1,000 kids there? He said, yes. And I got a friend of mine in Amarillo. I tried to find, I didn't have any friends in Midland, I guess. But <laughs> I, I tried to get somebody down there, but I started calling churches on phone. Uh, on the phone, said, you want to get your kids to come? And, and Dawson's a Baptist, so I, I called lots of Baptist churches. And, and we got, the first year, we had 1,010 students. Wow! I mean, I was so pumped. Well, they said, we'll do it again next year. And we moved to an, another venue the next year. We ended up, the last three years we did it, we, did, we had 8,000 kids in the Lubbock Civic Center in the exhibit hall. <laughs> Amen! I was the only full gospel, charismatic conference chairman out of 26 conferences they did here. Every time they came to Lubbock, he said, we get to hang out with our favorite tongue talker. <laughs> One year, Dawson came. He was sicker than a dog. He didn't know if he was going to be able to get up and speak or not. He called me on my cell phone. He said, listen, tongue talker, you got to come lay your hands on me and pray for me. So I went to his hotel and prayed for him. We were great friends, even when he quit doing conference. But, but that's, that's not a quiver to get to sit up there. This is memorabilia of me shooting my arrows. This is stuff that I see every day in my office. There's a dart gun standing straight up. It's got the, the darts on it. I got that one the first time I went to Africa, in Kakata, Africa, in Liberia. These guys gave me a dart gun. This little, this little ship right here was a memor some memorabilia from Cuba. This right here is all in Mongolian. It is the advertising, the public advertising for this event with my picture on it. There's my little brother and his family, I think. I, I'm looking at that. That's kind of weird. My grandparents, Pop and Jenny, are over here. You know what, Jenny, Michaela, you know what Jenny used to tell me? When I was younger than you, I'd go to Colorado and see them from living here. And Jenny would say, Ed, Ed, you're going to travel the world. I've only preached in 47 nations. But my grandmother used to tell me that. 
And then, of course, here's the greatest hero. This is, this is a pencil drawing done by a, a member of our church, her daughter, that, but the, the mom is deceased, and that's Jesus. And then this is a no parking uh, sign. I, 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 there's a teaching I've done with teenagers called no parking, and uh, I wanted to, uh, again, I guess I have to confess, I stole that sign. <laughs> but it was for my sermon, no parking. <laughs> so it was for a good cause. Why, why am I showing? Am I showing you that stuff to brag? No. I'm a thriver, not a survivor. I'm going to shoot my arrow. I'm going to bang my arrows. I'm going to strike the ground. Whatever the prophet, the man of God tells me, I'm going to do it. I'm going to keep doing it as your pastor. The question is, this series, The Last Arrow, is to challenge you to live above the norm. Anybody, and I do mean anybody, can be average. Defy the odds. So what if you miss? So what if people like the video, if they stand up and they all laugh at you? They weren't laughing when they got got through shooting those arrows. This last or next slide says quitters are survivors surviving. They're, that's all they're doing is surviving. Shooters, strikers, are thriving and defying the odds. Which group do you want to fit in? I, I can't make a choice for you. I just can't do it. I can stand up here and challenge and talk and tell stories and teach you about what the scriptures say, but you've got to get up every day and make a choice. They're going to shoot your arrow? You're going to strike the ground? Or are you going to put your stuff on the mantle and just admire it? I, I, look, at, I look at my stuff along those pictures. I, I'm in there every day. And I say, thank God for the privilege of the things I've gotten to do. One of the things I didn't point out in there, I got a piece of the Berlin Wall because I was preaching I was doing a tour of Germany. I started up in, in Hanover and went to Hamel just south and did a tour counterclockwise until I got back down to Frankfurt, Frankfurt and Wiesbaden where I flew in. And it was in October of 1991 when the wall fell. And my traveling companion, he was, a, he was an elder in our church at the time, and I took him with me and I looked at him and I said, we've got three days before we've got to be in Wiesbaden. There's no, no reason why we shouldn't just get over into, uh, go from West Berlin to East Berlin. If you've never checked that out, it's a three-hour journey to go from West Berlin to East. You think they're one little city? No. They're a three-hour train ride apart. We got over there, and we both rented a hammer and chisel. They were making money off that deal. (laughs) We rented us a hammer and chisel, and on all of those things up there, I've got a little piece of the Berlin Wall. And when you shoot your arrow, you get to do some unique stuff. Or are you just going to sit back in your rocking chair? <sighs> Another episode is the worm squirms. I mean, as the world turns. Yeah, that's old. Connie. <laughs> Connie's shouting me down. Well, I want to end by giving you three New, New Testament challenges today that challenge you to go beyond the average, that challenge you to get out of your comfort zone. The first scripture is found in Luke 12, 15. Jesus said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Man, how much of our possessions possess us? Or do we possess them? You will laugh at me 
And again, I showed you a picture of my office a while ago. I could show you this. I didn't take a picture of this, but on my desk, I've got this beautiful wooden case. It's about this big. It's got a glass top on it. It's got this, these velvet slots in it, and they have all of my favorite pens in them. <laughs> I went to the expense to buy a case <laughs> to put my Mont Blanc pen in it. If you don't know what a Mont Blanc is, it's a very expensive pen. I didn't buy it. It was given to me. But do your possessions have you? Or do you have them? Which is it? You've got to, Jesus said beware. And what he means there, that word in the Greek, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it because I don't read, write, or speak Greek. I just read big, thick books. That word means to get a mental image, to get it, not in your natural, you see it with your natural eye, but it's back here in your head. You're holding it here to have that mental image to guard, to watch out for. It's like if you, if somebody said to you, if you walk, if you walk down this path right here, it's really slick. It's got ice on it. It. That's what that word means. Guard, be careful. Take heed. That's icy right there. So beware. Watch out for this right here. Because, and then the word greed. Is so, I was blown away by the word greed, what it meant. It meant, and, and it was huge. There were a lot of writing and a lot of things. But I summed it up in just a few words. It means uncontrolled want. Uncontrolled. We were driving through the city on the way from our house to the post office and instead of going down all the major thoroughfares I went through some residential districts over by the post office and I drove by this house and it's a house that some friends of ours used to live in and they sold it a few years ago and I remember when they put it on the market I got online and looked at all the pictures because my friend's a home builder it's not wasn't Stephen Donna it was another guy in town that builds houses and oh man he had done Wow, he had done so many cool things with this older house. And, and he had taken, he bought the lot next to it, and he built a brand-new pool house and a brand-new swimming pool out there, and all those pictures were on there. And that's always been in the back of my mind. And we were driving around the corner, went by this house, and I called their name, and I said, you know, they did such a great job building that house and remodeling that house. If that house ever came up for sale and I was able, I want to live in that house. And Connie just looked at me. You know what Connie says, don't you? She always just says to me, I'm your helper. So being my helper, she went to me. She goes, man, your wanter's just out of control. <laughs> you know, needless to say, there was no more talk or commentary about the house. <laughs> or anything else for that matter. We just drove on in silence. How many of you know I just got told? <laughs> Teenagers know what that means, right? You just got told. I just got told. But see, this is what he's saying. He's saying life is more than the accumulation of stuff. Life is more than your talent. Life is more than your money. Life is more than your possessions. And we've got to heed that in this next verse. We're talking about shooting our arrows. We're talking about thriving, not just surviving. If you want to just survive, keep collecting stuff. If you want to thrive, you make your stuff go to work for you. Put your stuff to work for the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Matthew 6, Oh, it's so familiar. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. And above all else, live righteously and he will give you everything you need. See, if you'll just put God first, if you'll just put his kingdom first, all the things you need, they just come. God provides. God takes care of us. But he's got to be first. And it's not just Jesus first. Look what it says there. Seek the kingdom. Did you know the kingdom of God is bigger than your life? It, the kingdom of God is bigger than this church. The kingdom of God is bigger than the church in Lubbock, Texas. The kingdom of God, that God is doing something around the world in this day and age. We sang that song about revival, and I couldn't help but think about what's going on. What I recently read is going on in Iraq and Iran. There is a greater revival in the underground church in Iran and Iraq than has ever happened in China. We've always heard about the underground church in China. But listen, what the writers were saying... This 
this revival in Iraq and Iran among the Muslims is bigger than anything that's ever happened in China. Only heaven. I don't know about you. I want to get on that train. I want to be involved in what God's doing in his kingdom. This, this planet, I'm just passing through is what the Bible says. This is not my home. I can beware of all the things that you collect. None of my stuff is, my pen case is not going with me to heaven. Hello? It's going to sit right there on that desk and it, Connie's going to give it away to somebody. If I go before she does. Am I making any sense? We've got to make an investment. We've got to shoot. Strike the ground. Because there's something bigger than us. I hope that you feel being connected to Generations Church, the vision of this church, touch the city, teach the nation, train the world. I hope that you feel you're connected to something bigger than you are. Luke 9, 25 says, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? Wow. That word lost was an interesting word study for me. I discovered, I thought that it just meant you lose your salvation, and I kind of struggled with that a little bit because I know that, that that's, a, that's a big, 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 big debate in the, in the religious world. Which, by the way, I do believe that if you could walk away from God, God will never leave you, but you could leave Him. And that's kind of what this word's talking about. It, it, I, f- I found out that that Greek word there for lost is the exact same Greek word that Jesus uses over in Luke 15 when He says He leaves the 99 to go seek the one that's lost. That sheep has lost his way. He's departed from the group, and he's out here doing his own thing, or her own thing. And Jesus goes out to seek after that lost sheep. Can I just say, if, that, if you feel like you're, you've gotten so wrapped up in this world and so wrapped up in the things that's going on in your life, in this, this realm of this world, you're in it, but you're not of it, and that you've lost your way, come on, come on back. Get involved in the kingdom. Lay down the stuff. And it says that, that, that gain the whole world. You can get all the fame, all the fortune, all the money, but you could lose what's the most important. And the word destroyed was interesting. And it, what, what it just simply means is, is you've lost what's of value, what real, real, real value is. I sincerely hope that Those of you online and those of you right here in the room with me have learned something today. I hope you're challenged. But I've got to ask you, whether you're online or whether you're listening here, are you sure about the condition of your soul? Do you know that you know that you know that you know that if you lost your life by some horrible, tragic circumstance, that on the other side of that event, you would be with the Lord Jesus? If, that's you, if you know that, then celebrate that. But if you don't know that, and you're wrapped up in the things of this life, and you're wrapped up in the things of this world, surrender that stuff to receive the most important thing in your life. Receive Jesus. And then what, when you put Jesus first, he promises he'll take care of all your needs. He promises he'll never leave you. Now, I, I've got to look at every one of you, and online and in the room, I've got to look at you, and, 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 and I just have to promise you this. I'm not one of those preachers that will promise you that, that if you give your life to Jesus, everything's going to be all right tomorrow. No. Jesus never promised us easy. What he promised us is that he would never leave us or forsake us. And when you surrender your life to Jesus, you have a friend that sticks closer to a brother no matter what hell throws at you. 
and a promise that you can thrive and not just survive. A promise that even though the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, that he's come to give life and give you abundant life. But it's your choice. What do you choose? And if you're like one of those lost sheep that you knew where you belong, but you just strayed, hey, come on home. Come on home. Get your do-over. Get your do-over in the house today. Let's stand together and bow our head and close our eyes. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word today. I thank you for the truth that Jesus saves. That salvation is the free gift. Eternal life is the free gift of God. I thank you that Romans says that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Lord, I am a sinner, but I am a forgiven sinner because I've surrendered my life to you. Lord, I'm praying today for the one that fits the bill, that doesn't know Jesus, that their stuff possesses them, that they're not putting God first. That, Lord, maybe they are like King Jehoash. They're bored, they're tired. They're willing to stay in average. <laughs> Lord, I'm praying that they will strike the ground and 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 shoot their arrow. But the first step is come to know Jesus. Romans 10, 9 and 10, friends, says this, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart and you'll be saved. And then the next verse reverses it. It says, believe and confess. It really is that simple. If you're listening to us online, we're going to pray in a moment. We're going to lead. We're all going to pray the sinner's prayer. You say, Pastor, why are we all going to do it? Because we've got to help people that are struggling with making this decision. I know that most of us in this room have already made this decision. They need to hear you pray it. They, you know you prayed it before. But pray it again. Let's help somebody in the room. Let's help somebody online. Let's let them, let them hear us through the speakers. Put your right hand over your heart with me and say this out loud, please. Lord Jesus, thanks for dying on the cross for me. I need a Savior because I'm a sinner. Thank you for loving me that much. I turn from my sin. I repent of my sin. I invite you into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Father, I pray for the people who prayed that prayer for the first time today. That, Lord, openly they would surrender their life to Jesus today. That, Lord, you would give them a do-over. And they would get a fresh start. There's people in this room that are new Christ followers. They prayed this prayer just a few weeks ago. God, thank you for them. Thank you for their faith that they're growing. Lord, I pray that those that are online that won't just pray that prayer, what you need to do is just hit the link that's showing up and just tap that link and it'll take you to a And just type in there, Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you. And put your email and I will reach out to you personally. If you're in the room and you prayed that prayer today, you're coming home or you prayed it for the first time, would you just lift your hand up with me right now? Is there anybody in this room? Let me shield my eyes. I'm looking to my right, your left. Anybody else? Thank you so much. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Audrey, would you stand next to her right there? She's got her hand raised. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the faith of this young lady that's being changed today. Thank you, Jesus. We know what she's done. She's prayed a prayer. She wants a new start. Lord, we believe for this young lady that she will be changed from the inside out. Lord, we'll help her. We'll give her tools to, to a fresh start. She's already surrounded by friends right there where she's sitting that love her and care about her. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Go ahead and be seated for just a moment.
we've come to the spot in our service where we give. We obey Jesus. You know, I am overwhelmed constantly by the generosity of people that attend Generations Church, people that give online, people that, those of you that obey Jesus and honor God with your tithe and with your offerings. We stand on the promise of Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 that says the generous soul will be made rich. My prayer today is that everybody that obeys you, Lord, through generosity, Lord, that they give and they gave for kids to go to camp, kids camp and youth camp. They gave to help me get to Africa. They give, Lord, they're not giving to me, they're giving to you to enable the kingdom of God to be blessed. Lord, I pray over them. I thank you for their generosity. If you're sitting here today, there's an envelope around you somewhere, and if you want to give cash, you can put that in there and put your information, seal it up. If you want to put your check in there, if you do the old-fashioned thing like me, uh, you put your check in there. There's a brown box at the back of the sanctuary sitting on a table. It has a slot in the top of it. And when service is dismissed, you just walk by there and put that in there. If you are, are a digital giver, the methods are on the screen there. Our website, um, you, I don't know if you know it or not, but we've got a new website up and running. It's not perfect yet. We're still working on it. Um, text and give, that number's there. Of course, I highly encourage you to get the app, not just to give with. There's all kinds of great information on the app. I don't know if you know it or not, but if you'll download the app in the Apple Store or the Google Play Store, you can register your kids for Vacation Bible School right there on the app. And so it's a great tool to use. Um, my, the sermons are on there, the audio version anyway. Um, so anyway, uh, you can do those things. But get your gift in your hand or your device in your hand is, that you've used to give with. Father, I thank you for the blessing of God over every tither. Lord, in Jesus' name, that windows of heaven are open. Lord, that there's blessings poured out that there's not room enough to contain. And Lord, that the devourer is rebuked on their behalf. And those that give offerings over and above their tithe, God, may they be blessed 30, 60, and 100 fold. We stand upon your word thanking you for obedient servants of God. In Jesus' name, amen.